Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. And Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in what we hope, what we believe are the closing months of this pandemic, we know that transformation is necessary, that we cannot go back to the world as it was. Arundhati Roy wrote at the start of this pandemic that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging all that we have, or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and to fight for it. What other world will we imagine? How will we bring it into being? Step lightly and with little luggage, be beloveds, there is still much work to be done. Our opening words this morning are from the Reverend Gretchen Haley. It starts here in this moment, in this breath, you feel rising in your chest, the beat building between us, the healing, the hunger, the hope, the courage, the calling, the commitment, the drawing out of a new day. It is the imagination in this story we weave together, this song we sing, this prayer we bring into being from our hearts to our lips, from our hands to our life. Our shared life starts here, with praise and thanksgiving, forgiveness and this humble centering, confession that we could be wrong, this promise that we make to keep learning, to keep trying, to keep our sense of humor, to keep close this knowing that we are all in this together. Come, let us begin. Come, let us worship together. I do want to say a note about this morning's service before we begin. The relationship between the Unitarian Church of Lincoln and the Mighty Quinn Chapel is a long one. Both congregations were founded 150 years ago, and while the form has changed, this is not the first time our congregations have collaborated with each other. In the past several years, we've done pulpit exchanges where the preachers simply swap for the day. This time of online worship, however, opens up a new possibility. At the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we record our service ahead of time. Quinn is live on Sunday morning. And that means that Reverend Brandy Jasmine Mimitzrayam and I can be in both places at once. We can both be in both places at once in a joint service on imagination and possibility. So welcome, Reverend Mimitzrayam. We're We've each taken readings from the other tradition, so while I will be reflecting this morning on Ephesians 3.20, Reverend Mimitzrayim will take on some of our Soul Matters material on imagination. The first time I preached at Quinn, Reverend Cooper worked Proverbs 27.17 into the intro. As iron sharpens iron, she reminded us, so do we sharpen each other. True enough. But there is also what the Psalms tell us. 
how good and pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. Welcome, friends, and let us begin. Our story today is called I Will Make Miracles, and it's by Susie Morgenstern. Everyone keeps asking me, when you get older, what will you be? I say plumber or pilot or dance the ballet, although the truth is I don't really know what to say. But today I woke up and peeked out my left eye, and the sun had just started to climb to the sky. That's when I realized it just might be fun to spend every morning waking the sun. Then I might stir up the waves in the ocean. My undersea concert would rock with commotion. Next thing I'd do, I'd heal all the sick with vanilla milkshakes, creamy and thick. I'd wake the dead, I'd wake them all and give them one last chance to play ball. I'd help enforce the rules. I'd change people who were cruel. I'd make the world stop fighting. I'd get it down in writing. I'd shout it far and near and everyone would hear. I'll make miracles my mission and be the number one magician. I'll meet everyone on earth and ask about their dreams because life is more, much more than it seems. My giant loaf of bread will cure the world of hunger and people who eat it will feel 10 years younger. And then for the child who has nothing to wear, I'll sew her a dress that will answer her prayer. I will stamp out earthquakes, floods, and fire. The world will stop shaking, be cooler and drier. I will stretch out our days and our nights to feel longer so everyone has time to grow stronger. I'll fill up the world with people who share, with people who smile, with people who care. It might sound like God is who I want to be, and maybe it's true, but here's the key. To change the world, to change a mind, what I should remember first is to always be kind. And that is the end of our story. When Weatherly returned to Lincoln in March of 1929 to begin his second ministry at All Souls Unitarian Church, he found a changed Lincoln. After World War I, the city experienced an increase in both discrimination and segregation. Lincoln had its own chapter of the Ku Klux Klan with a clavern at 7th and Washington Streets. On September 11th, 1925, the, the Klan sponsored a parade down O Street. After the parade, the celebration continued on Capitol Beach in the light of three large burning crosses on rafts in the water. The African-American community, even before Weatherly returned, realized that their churches alone could not solve the problem of racial injustice and racial development. At a mass meeting of the congregants of three black churches in February of 1929 at the AME Quinn Chapel, it was agreed that a social organization was needed to supplement the work of the churches. Since the Lincoln chapter of the NAACP had declined in the late 1920s, the black community decided to form a Lincoln chapter of the National Urban League, formed in 1910, to promote social and economic justice for African Americans. In 1933, during the height of the Great Depression, unemployment rates among African Americans were at times four to six times higher than unemployment among whites. The saying among black workers that they were the last to be hired and first to be hired was especially true during the Depression when whites no longer had any scruples about taking jobs they previously felt were beneath them. In January of 1933, J.H. Kearns, Executive Secretary of the Omaha Urban League, 
who had conducted a survey of the black community in Lincoln, recommended the establishment of a Lincoln branch of the Urban League. And in March of the same year, a committee consisting of Millard T. Woods, African American Executive Secretary of the League, Weatherly, President of the League's Board of Directors, and Trago T. McWilliams, African American Vice President of the League, applied for membership <coughs> excuse me, to the Council of Social Agencies that coordinated and secured cooperation for welfare work. The Council accepted the League's membership. It marked the first time an African American organization was accepted. The next year, the League became a member of the Community Chest. It was fortunate that Weatherly was also president of the Lincoln Social Service Club in 1933. During this time, the ripples of the Harlem Renaissance began to be felt across America, even in smaller towns like Lincoln. Elaine Locke, called the father of the Harlem Renaissance, published an anthology of works by African Americans in 1925 entitled The New Negro, an Interpretation. This work challenged the old hateful stereotypes of African Americans and reveled in vibrant new forms of creativity. Aaron Douglas, who had graduated from the School of Fine Arts at the University of Nebraska in 1922, went on to become one of the premier painters of the Harlem Renaissance. Each week we take up a collection to support this congregation and our partners in the wider community. We do this because we each gain from being a part of this community in many different ways and we each give back to this community in many different ways and contributions of time, of talent, and of treasure. If you'd like to give this morning, the easiest way to do that is simply to text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. As this next song plays, again, you can text UC Lincoln and the amount you wish to give to 73256. Thank you for your generosity. In 1979, the poet Audre Lorde had breast cancer. In 1980, she published a volume of the journals she wrote during that period. She called it the Cancer Journals. This morning, I'll read an excerpt from that. Quote, my visions of a future I can create have been honed by the lessons of my limitations. Now I wish to give form with honesty and precision to the pain, faith, labor, and loving 
which this period of my life has translated into strength for me. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less important whether or not I am unafraid. I had to remind myself that I had lived through it all already. I had known the pain and survived it. It only remains for me to give it voice, to share it for use, that the pain not be wasted." End quote. We've been through it all already. We've lived through so much. We've been through it all this last year. We've lived through it all oh, this last four years. We've been through some things over the last four years. We've, we've lived through so much in our lifetimes over the last 40 years or 60 years. We've been through so much and then some of us still carry the baggage of the last 400 years. Some of us still carry the baggage of the last 500 years. Some of us still carry the baggage of the last century and, and the last millennium of the oppression and repression and system ways in which our beings are stifled, in which our humanity is shuttered, and in which we are systematically broken by society. We've been through it all. We've got the scars to show it. We've got the baggage to show it. And here we are on the cusp of a new beginning. Here we are with a president whose name we can say, here we are standing on the brink of new possibilities, on the cusp of change. Looking forward to what tomorrow might hold. Looking forward to the future. Still concerned about the presence of COVID in our community. Still concerned that the schools aren't open. Still concerned about whether or not Black lives are safe. Still concerned about whether or not BGTQLI people will be safe in our communities and safe at work. Still concerned about all of the ills of the past that we're bringing forward into tomorrow. We are still concerned and some of us might even be afraid afraid of what this new beginning might hold, uh, afraid that this new beginning might not look too different from yesterday, uh, afraid that tomorrow might not look too different from the past. We can become afraid of what the future might hold because we don't get to know tomorrow. We can become afraid of what the future might hold because we don't get to see what's next. We can become afraid of the possibilities of even what looks like a promising start of neoliberalism because we don't get to control what will happen. But we, we can imagine it. We get to imagine it. We get to imagine the future better. We, we get to imagine a tomorrow that is better than yesterday. We get to imagine a tomorrow that is better than what we've been through. We get to shift our way from tyranny and trauma to hope and normalcy. We get to imagine the possibilities to be greater than we've ever seen before. We get to imagine as we take the pain of the past and, and provide the power to fit fuel our imagination as, as we take the, the hurt and the trauma from all that we've already lived through and, and allow them to become the, the foundation of our imagination for the future. We can imagine greater if we take the past and, and stand on it and let it fuel our imagination for the future. So how do we, how do we imagine greater than we've ever seen before? How do we imagine a future that is more promising than our past? How do we imagine what we've never even begun to see, these possibilities that we can't perceive? How do we imagine what eye has not seen and ear has not heard? Well, we translate the pain from the past into the strength to envision. We transform the despair of, of our trauma in, into the courage to imagine. We transition the terror of uncertainty into the service of possibility, 
in order to fuel our imaginations, in order to imagine better. We, we can't pretend the past didn't happen. We, we've got to bring ourselves forward into the future, forward into the present and imagine a better future by using the past as our strength. First thing we have to do is we have to take the lessons of our past. We, we have to take the lessons, the things that we've learned, the, the things that we're carrying in those bags that we think are just hurt and pain and scars. We have to take them and treat them as lessons. What did we learn? We, we learned this last year that no matter how difficult things get, that we're not by ourselves. We've, we've learned that, that we have a community that we can stand together. And we've learned that, that no matter how heavy the baggage gets, that, that we have other people that we can lean on, that we have other people that we can count on. We've learned that, that we don't even have to be powerful in ourselves because we are surrounded by, by a cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by people who love us. We've learned that we can move through whatever comes our way, that, that we can climb over mountains, that, that we can move through the valleys of the shadow of death. We've learned that, that no matter how dark the day gets, that we have hope that we can hold on to. We have learned that we can make it, that, that we can survive. And even when we don't, we have learned that we are loved. We have learned that we will still be okay. The second thing we need to do is to take the wisdom and the wisdom from the last four years, the, the wisdom even from, from the Obama era, the wisdom of our past is that we can't be silent, that we can't just rest, that our silence, as Audrey Lord says, will not save us, that, that we have to speak out, not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors. Our, the wisdom that, that, that we have learned from the past is, is if we sit on our voices, if we sit on our witness, if we sit on our testimonies, if we sit on our stories, then, then the tyranny will come back, then, then the pain will be worse, then, then the, 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 the hope and the, the drama and despair will be worse, that the ache will be stronger. We have learned that, that our silence will not save us, so we have to transform our silence into action and speech. The wisdom of the last four years has taught us that, that in order to imagine a better future, we have to speak about our trauma. We have to speak about our past. We have to speak to each other. The wisdom that we've carried forward says that we have to be willing to stand up, to be with each other, to speak up on behalf of each other, and to use what we have learned to make the world better, to, to transform the future into more than we can imagine, to, to make a better tomorrow. We need to take the wisdom of the past and, and transform ourselves so that we can imagine a better future. Let the past be transformed into strength to provide fuel for your imagination. The third thing is exactly that. Let the pain of the past be transformed into strength to imagine a better tomorrow, to envision a better future. Be transformed and translated into strength for the vision that you have for your life, for your community, for our world, for each other. That strength doesn't come by not being afraid. That strength doesn't come by trying to be something other than the human that you are. That, that strength doesn't come by denying your human fragility, by denying your human limitations. That strength comes by acknowledging that you really do have the ability to, the power of imagination, that you really do have the power of hope, that you really do have the power to make things happen, that you really do have the power of dreams in a container, in a body, in your humanness, which is fragile, which is limited, which will perish, that even though you are fragile, even though you might break, even though we together are just human beings, that the power that is in us, the power that is among us, the power that runs through us is strong enough to, to transform our present reality, to shift us from where we are into to greater things, to, to shift us from where we are into, into grander possibilities, to shift us from where we are and in, into a brighter future. If we use 
the strength from, from our limitations, if we use the, the strength that we've gotten from our pain, if, if we use the strength from our brokenness, if we use our strength, we can imagine a better future. We can imagine a better tomorrow. My dad was a mechanic. He fixed appliances from Sears Scratch and Dent, and he sold them. Some, most of the time he gave them away to people who were in need, but he fixed the appliances. And one of the things he taught me was how and when to use duct tape. There are certain things that you can use duct tape on. And I know a lot of people think you can use it on most on everything, but, but my dad taught me how and when to use duct tape and how and when to repair the thing. And what he said is, if you expect it to last a long time, fix it the right way. If you expect it to have to go through something else, fix it the right way. If you expect it to last, fix it the right way. If you know it's not going to last long, put duct tape on it. If you know you're not going to put any more pressure on it, put duct tape on it. If you know it's not going to go through anything else, put duct tape on it. It'll do. You don't have to fix it. And I'm reminded of a, a conversation that I had with a friend of mine about how we do that to ourselves. We've been through things, we're broken, and, and, and we're, we're healing from the past. We're working through our fear. We, we, we think that we've healed, and all we've really done is put duct tape on our wounds. And I told her that we need to rip the duct tape off and fix it the right way. Because when we fix it the right way, we have the ability to withstand more. We, we have the ability to trust the power that's within us and around us to keep us strong. When we fix it the right way, we can stand through it all. When we fix it the right way, we, we can share our stories. When we fix it the right way, we don't have to be afraid. And, and even if we are, we can use that fear to fuel us to imagine that we can get through something else. We, we can use that fear to fuel us to imagine that, that whatever tomorrow brings, we will be okay. If we fix ourselves the right way, that, then we will be strong enough to imagine a better future. We will be strong enough to imagine a better tomorrow. We will be strong enough just to dream bigger dreams. If we fix ourselves the right way, we will be able to fuel our imaginations and allow the pain from our past to power our imagination. And so my siblings, my friends, my beloved, allow the lessons from your trauma to fuel your imagination of a better future. Allow the wisdom from your pain to fuel your visions of the possibility of a better tomorrow. Allow the strength from our brokenness to fuel our hope for a brighter reality. Dream bigger. Believe grander. Imagine greater. Hope endlessly and have faith with power. We have lived through it all already. We can survive more. We have known the pain and we survived it. All that remains is for us to give ourselves permission to have a voice. All that remains for us is to share our strength and its use. All that remains for us is to imagine a better future. This week, we recognize two landmarks in the world. Pray for health and wisdom for the new administration in Washington, D.C. And we join in deep sorrow as we mark 400,000 people dead in this country from the coronavirus. It has been one year exactly this week since the first cases were announced on the West Coast and New York. And every week that we gather, whether in person or online, we set aside time in our service to recognize the joys and sorrows of our lives together. 
because we know that joy and sorrow is not simply contained in the big stories. It's also in the stories that each of us bring to this place. A new job, a fall, hopes for the coming year, a diagnosis, a birthday. Our community is made up of these stories and we are richer for sharing them. As this next song plays, please type your name or the name of someone you are carrying in your heart this week in the chat box. Thank you for your presence. Over the last year, one of the highlights of my ministry has been the opportunity to return to seminary part-time, to start working on a doctorate of ministry. A few weeks ago, I was in class on Zoom, and we were reflecting on a reading the professor had assigned, the eight virtues of successful churches. And most of the things are, are things that we come back to over and over again, be flexible, take risks be about message rather than members, that kind of thing. But in the middle of class, another student and I confessed that we had had a lot of trouble with one of the virtues the authors listed, that we should believe in miracles. Believe in miracles. Sure, as a, as a theoretical exercise, absolutely. My friend serves a liberal church of the brethren, and we can both say that we see miracles every day in the smile of our kids or in a member in the midst of a global pandemic getting on Zoom and connecting with the congregation for the first time in months. But miracle miracles? Walls of Jericho miracles? Calming a storm on the Sea of Galilee miracles? A country healing from systemic racism and pandemic? That kind of miracle? Oh, come on now. I have to figure out how to reopen a church building safely. I cannot possibly imagine, much less depend on, a miracle to solve the day-to-day the -day problems of my life and my church. Glory to God, Paul writes, who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine or in language that I preach from more often at my own congregation, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. The, po the point that Paul is making, and, and Shakespeare, by way of the prevaricating prince of Denmark, seems to be getting at as well, is that God, the universe, is not bound by the limits of our very human imagination. We can recognize this in the negative, right? 
So I'm from Michigan originally, and in my family, the, the Detroit Red Wings have the status of a minor religion. Part of this is the general lack of options for sports, I suppose. Go Lions! But also it's this, for all of my childhood and most of my adulthood, the Red Wings were the best hockey team in the world. They made the playoffs for 25 consecutive years, a quarter of a century. No sports team in any major professional sport has done that. They, they won the championship of their conference six times during that run. In 1997 and 1998, they won consecutive Stanley Cups. They won again in 2002. In 2008, they won another. And then in 2009, made the Stanley Cup Finals. Now, the, the Stanley Cup Finals are the best of seven games, and it went to seven games best y that year. But the Red Wings are the Red Wings, and I, I was traveling during the series, so I was unable to watch it. But I remember going to bed on the night of that Game 7, sure, 100% positive, that the Red Wings were going to repeat as champions, and I was going to introduce my entire Peace Corps placement to the joy of American hockey. Of course, you can probably guess, because I'm telling this story, that that didn't happen. The Pittsburgh Penguins won that Game 7. And then the next year, Pittsburgh repeated as champions. The point of this meandering story about hockey is this. That feeling of something inconceivable happening that we literally could not imagine until calamity happens. We all know that. Hockey is a relatively light example, but it could be hard stuff. A diagnosis, an, un an election that goes in an unexpected direction, a fall from a family member. Or it can be pretty meaningless in the grand scheme of things like a hockey championship. And if it can happen for negative things, if it can happen for calamities, then who are we to say that it cannot for miracles? My grandfather has this, this quote in his email signature that the universe is stranger than we can imagine, but it is also stranger than we can imagine. Glory to God who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine by his power at work within us. There's a strange note to this line by Paul that I want to end on. Yes, God is able to do more than we can imagine or ask. But that doing happens not through God leaning down and moving a hockey puck, but through God's power at work within us. We are capable of more than we can imagine. So back to that class two weeks ago. For my colleague and I who couldn't imagine miracles, who are we? to limit ourselves in our churches by what we can imagine. Because we know that's not how churches work. I have never, in 10 years of working at and with Unitarian Universalist churches, been able to predict or guess who is going to be touched in what way, on what day, by what words. Sure, we get up and say them. You preachers spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to say. They are so often received in ways that we cannot imagine. Call it the spirit, call it grace, call it the abundant strangeness of the universe, it's there. So shall we imagine miracles? That's actually not the right question. Because Paul tells us that miracles are going to happen whether or not we imagine them. He tells us that God is not bound by the limits of our imagination. The question then is, how will we respond to the miracle?
Imagination opens up possibility. We are not limited by the world we see right in front of us, and God is not limited by our imagination. So let us go forth and dream impossible dreams. Together and in the days to come, let us dream them together. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen.